A while back, I dated this girl who was kinda... high maintenance. It was a really one-sided relationship. We always listened to her music, she expected expensive gifts, and she told me what clothes to wear. The funny thing is, she was so negative no matter how positive I tried to be. I'd really regret that relationship if it hadn't helped me understand ionic bonds. That's what's up next on PS100. Ionic bonds are like unequal relationships, where one person is always giving and the other is always taking. This table salt is a good example. Table salt is made up of a metal, sodium, and a non-metal, chlorine. All atoms want to fill up their valence electron shells, and whichever atom has the fewest empty spaces to fill in those shells tends to take electrons. Chlorine only needs one electron to complete its outer shell, and sodium needs seven. So the chlorine atom, like my high-maintenance girlfriend, takes an electron without giving anything in return. <laughs> in doing so, the charge in both atoms becomes imbalanced, losing a negatively charged electron makes the sodium a positively charged ion, and gaining an electron makes the chlorine more negative. Since these two ions now have opposite charges, they are attracted to one another, creating a codependent relationship. It's important to know that you'll never find just one NaCl pairing. They're always found in groups, dissolved in a solution, or in crystals. Beyond this analogy, the pattern of positive and negative charges created by ionic bonds explains why ionic compounds look and behave like this. The rigid pattern of charges is what makes ionic compounds so brittle. When you hit a salt with a hammer, Ions with the same charge come in contact with one another, and since like charges repel, the compound will shatter. Because electrons in ionic compounds are locked into their atoms in filled low energy orbitals, they can't carry an electrical current the way delocalized electrons do in a metal. Instead, charges in ionic compounds can only move by moving entire ions, which are big and awkward compared to electrons. So the only way to conduct electricity through an ionic compound is to melt it or dissolve it in water so the ions separate. Even then, they won't conduct electricity as well as metals do. Speaking of melting ionic compounds, that actually takes a lot of thermal energy. That's because the electrostatic force holding atoms together depends on the charges of those atoms. Since ions have large charges on them, the electrostatic force of each ion reaches out and attracts oppositely charged ions several neighbors away. So they're all working together to hold each other in place. Even when they are heated enough to melt, that force keeps them together in clusters, and it takes even more heat to break down those clusters and make the compound boil. Light, which is made of photons, can only be absorbed by materials that have electron energy levels with the right energies. The difference in energies between two levels has to match the energy of the photon. The electron energy states in an ionic compound are widely spaced, most so far apart that they only absorb high energy ultraviolet photons. Most visible photons pass right through. If you grind a transparent salt down into a fine powder, those small particles will bend light so much that the photons get scattered and the compound appears white. The same thing happens when other transparent minerals have a lot of little cracks or bubbles in them. In either case, the ionic compounds still aren't absorbing photons. They're just scattering them like crazy. That's it for this episode, but be sure to check out the link below for more science and research opportunities for BYU undergrads.